Amen. So here are some of the, here are some of our books on faith and healing. If you've read the New Testament, you know it is much about faith and and healing as Jesus was sent into the world to to cure those that were oppressed of the of the devil. And so to do that, you need faith. Often Jesus would say it is your faith that has has made you whole. And so we have we have some books on that. These are just basic tools to walk in an apostolic prophetic kingdom, Jesus, Jesus ministry. Amen. And so these are just some basic tools. My wife, Prophet Tiffany, is also an author. I think she's getting ready to write two more volumes of these books. Um, she's already started writing. We don't look like what we've been through. And how many of you know that's the truth in Jesus' name? And then also we have Building on the Foundation, the Word Building System. Um, many of you have been asking, and it's, as we go from conference to conference and from church to church, someone always asks us the fundamental question since we're teaching in the prophetic. That question is, how do I discern my voice from the Father's voice? How do I discern my voice from Jesus' voice? And the answer to that is that you must get into the Word of God. The scripture said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was that was made. And so it's to the extent to which you will know God himself. The Word. Um, this sounds like uh, Kingdom Elementary School, but I, I challenge you to re-enroll. It is, it's, it, we, we make Christian, one of my good friends said we make Christianity complicated so that we won't have to be Christian. And so Christ, Christianity is not complicated, really. Um, all we have to do to hear clearly the voice of the Lord God is pray and read the Bible. Look at your neighbor and say, read the Bible. All right. And so those are the two fundamental tools. Building on the Foundation is a book to teach you how to memorize. Say memorize. It is a book to teach you how to memorize and meditate. Say meditate. How to memorize and meditate on the word of, of God. Say amen to that. All right. Who, who meditates on his word day and night. Psalm one beginning at verse two say you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth your fruit in season your leaf also shall not wither and whatever you do shall shall prosper and so that's the state that we want to find ourselves in all right what i did a little improvising is that all right Joanne was trying to show you our KI Global School. Our next class, we're, we're, we're already in session this semester. There are five adult classes already in session. Our Kingdom Institute is a global school now, which means that we have face-to-face -face learning along with online learning. So you can be an online-only student, all right? Um, two of our online only classes are before UKI Prime already started on March the 5th. Uh, Prophet Joanne will be teaching Deliverance 101, which is actually one of her books. That class will begin on March the 20th on next Saturday, beginning at 10 a.m. I asked her to teach at 10 a.m. so that people in Africa who are eight hours ahead of us it would be 6 p.m. and they would have the opportunity to enroll in the class as well. Excuse me, if that's what they wanted to do. Say amen to that. And so um, you too can enroll. I encourage you, if there's a deliverance call on your life, if there's a prophetic call on your life, if you feel that God is calling you into the fourfold ministry, some of you call it the fivefold. I know that I'm not going to teach on that today. But if you feel that you have been called to be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, or what I call a pastor teacher, then you want to enroll in this class. Say amen to that. You can enroll in this class by simply going to the kingdomac.com. If you go to the kingdomac.com, you can see our global kingdom institute, our, our KI global school. 
and you can enroll or you can just take a picture of this with your phone and, and put this in your URL on your phone and get registered for class. There will be many more classes that we will be offering this year. We'll be offering an in, in in a apostolic 101 class this year, as well as some other classes. We also offer leadership and business classes as well. Um, how many of you are entrepreneurs? God has called you to start a business where well, you need to, that means you need some strategy. You need some organizational behavior and development. That means you need some Porter's Five Forces in your mind. How many of you know what Porter's Five Forces? That means you need some supply chain, you need some value chain, you need some Maslow's hierarchy of needs in your life. Is that all right? And so just because we're apostolic and we're in the, you know, the kingdom of God is about more things than Daniel in the lion's den. There's some more things that we have to learn uh, to be apostolic strategists that we might get to the top of our mountain. So if that's you, begin to look for class, say it's time to go back to school. Apostle Kenya already said school is in session, and so she's already in the prophetic book. All right, this is what I want to, to speak to you about as we, as we be, well, I don't want to say we're wrapping up our session because I'm about to launch you, so we're about to begin, <laughs> all right? And so I want to talk to you, I'm going to talk to you about several things, and I, I grew up Baptist, and this is a Baptist no-no to talk about more than one thing at a time. Which is why I came out of doing that and became apostolic so I could be free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I could be free to talk to you about more than a three-part message at one time. Is that all right? And so I want to talk to you about the establishment anointing. I want to talk to you about awaking and arise. We declare this year to be the year to return and rebuild. Prophet Tiffany has also declared this to be the year to arise and redeem. And so we will find that now it is time to awake and arise and begin to move in the apostolic. And I also want to talk to you about the anointing, say the anointing of the oxen. All right, that's a lot. What that means is you'll need your Bible, you'll need your pen, you'll need your notes. Come on, Sister Kira, you should already be at the end by now. And we begin preaching and prophesying, casting out demons, raising from the dead in Jesus' name. Is that all right? All right. Let's talk, I want to talk to you a little bit about my mandate as Apostle Kenya has said, it's time to, to commission you. And I want to make sure you have an understanding. We talk a lot about the prophetic at apostolic and prophetic gatherings. And that's mainly because people like the prophetic. The kingdom of God is built on the prophetic. Everything that you've ever seen, everything that you've ever known, everything that you've ever heard, really, believe it or not, is built on the prophetic because God called those things that are not as though they were. That's how we got on this on this planet. And so, of course, the, the, the prophetic is an attractive theme to learn about in, in conferences. And so because of that, I have the need as an apostle of Jesus Christ to make sure I differentiate the job of a prophet versus the job of an apostle, because they can get very confusing. And so um, my first mandate today is to apostolically, say apostolically, is to apostolically thrust us into the next season, but to do it in the now, though. All right. So I'm going to talk. About, I, I want to get you to the next season, but to get you to the next season, I have to get you there today. Is that OK? And what, one thing that I want to make sure that you understand, because it's very difficult to understand the difference between an apostle and a prophet. And the reason is because both an apostle and a prophet are prophetic. They both operate in the prophetic realm, are the establishers of the church. The apostle that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Both apostles and prophets can cast out demons. Both apostles and prophets can cast out demons. Because they both operate in the prophetic 
And then you can write this down if you so desire, but I want, if you can think of it this way, then, then this will remove us from abusing apostles and prophets. And it will also remove us from being abused by apostles and prophets. Is that okay? All right. You've heard well in this conference that prophets are concerned with time. How many of you heard that this weekend? The reason why prophets are concerned with time is because prophets are primarily the keepers of the prophetic. And the prophetic is concerned with timing. Prophecy is not of any value without the component of time. For someone will say to you, well, thus saith this or that is What's the value to you when you receive even a personal prophetic word? What you really want to know is, well, when is this going to come to, to pass? That's the value of the prophetic. What 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 sets off a alarm inside of your soul? Not come to pass. That is because the prophetic is very much founded on time. And prophets are very much timely people. You've, you've, you've heard this said as we've been in this in this conference, that, that prophets are concerned with whether or not they should say a thing to you or not. When, when should we begin to release these things? Prophets are concerned with the time. Prophets are concerned with the time. Prophets are concerned with the time. The difference between prophets and apostles, the main difference is that apostles are not time bound. Though prophets operate, though apostles too operate in the prophetic, apostles operate outside of the now. That is the main difference. Let me say it another way. Prophets prophesy. This is a generalization. This is generally true. But if you can appreciate that, you can know the difference. Prophets prophesy into the future. Apostles prophesy from the future. That is the main difference. Apostles are proton or first or pioneers or come here, uh, Apostle, Prophet Joe. I'm calling you all. Come here, Prophet Joe. You got to function as a prophet, right? All right. So <clears throat> prophets prophesy into the future. But apostles are pioneers that go first. And as they go first, something and begin to prophesy, they prophesy from the future. That's the main difference between the prophet who's going into the future and the apostle who's already standing as one who is first, one who is proton. One who is a pioneer, the, the, the apostle prophesies to you, but turning his back toward the future and prophesying is already located. Does that, did that help you a little bit? Now, the, the, that creates a problem, though, in the apostolic prophetic relationship. Mm -hmm. In the apostolic, this my, my wife and I have this problem. I'm going to say this. <laughs> It creates a problem. It creates a problem in the apostolic prophetic relationship because the prophet is always trying to bring the apostle back into the land. Which is why my wife always because she won't get stay in the the land. But I cannot stay in the land because I always stay where she currently is. And the apostle is always trying to pull the prophet into the, the future. But that's a problem because the prophet does not want to go into the future. The prophet is always agitated because the apostle is not in the now. Did I just help you? All right, thank you, Prophet Joe. In a hand, yeah. 
why why do I want why did I want to explain that to you? Because my first mandate is to apostolically thrust you into the next season now. And the, the reason why it's important to understand when you are in the presence of an apostle is because an apostle does not have to wait to prophesy to you based on timing. That is not what an apostle does. Apostles don't give a care, nothing about time. An apostle wants you to step into your deliverance. Get your character together first before you can step into that because you're not ready. You need to get your life together. You need to stop shacking up, sleeping around, drinking, smoking. There's some things you need to get in order because it is a process for you to get where you're going. But the It's like in your hand and begin prophesying. And you say, why are you calling me up to begin prophesying? Because the apostle is able to prophesy. To thrust you now. That's the main difference between us. All right. And so as, as I'm going to prophesy to you today, you're going to be tempted to say back to me, I need to pray about that. But I don't need your prayer. It's, it's, it's just so we can be clear about the relationship. Look at someone and say, it's about the relationship. And so I'm, I'm, the reason I'm starting with this is because I'm not trying to offend anyone. Sister Jewel, I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings. I'm just, I'm just, I just want you to know, if you understand me, then you might say, I need to pray. listening so i want to apostolically thrust you into something i'm going to as a as a general begin to push you into something but you're going to have to trust that i'm moving in the the apostolic and you're going to have to you'll see in a minute that the anointing is on my life so don't look for the season like it's not my season like i don't care if it ain't your season the reason why God created apostles is to quicken us into something before our season. If you if you watch the ministry of Jesus, he would be able to do something. He even told his mama. He said, uh, woman, this is not my, my time. She said, but I know you're an apostle, though, so turn this part of the wire. <laughs> something about that. And so he was able to move out of and that was the apostolic anointing on his life. He's able to bring something to pass before it is time. That's what we're going to do this afternoon. Is that all right? The second is to, I want to foster, I'm here to foster an environment that is conducive for each of us to make a decision to lead. Say lead. Mm -hmm. And we need to lead for, for Jesus in the next season. Yes. Some of you are not ready to lead for Jesus yet. Some of you have been running from, from leadership, from Jesus all your life. All right, but why, why, why I am here is to get you to begin leading for Jesus now. For some of you, that's going to mean that you are going to become aware of a calling of God on your life that you were not previously aware of. That is very possible in the body of Christ that you can be called to do something that you have not been made aware of yet. Quite often, somebody will begin to say, like my sister-in-law began to say, I never heard God say that I'm a prophet. That's okay. There's no need in the body of Christ for you to know everything that God has called you into in the future, in the now. There is no need to pretend like you are someone who you're not. The, the, the only prerequisite to do something for God is that you must constantly be making a decision in the now to be sold out for Jesus. That's the prerequisite. You, you, you must be constantly making a decision to give your life for the cause of Christ. If you make a constant decision every day when you awaken 
to do that, then you'll get there. Look at your neighbor and say, you'll get there. All right. Number three, I want to release us into the Father's power of corporate gathering. Amen. Write that down. I want to, this afternoon, I want to release us into the Father's power of corporate gathering. I said, I asked you to pray about this before we left yesterday's ending session. And the reason why I want you to get into the power of corporate gathering is because there are things that the Father will not reveal to you while you are by yourself. And so there are many Christians in the world who believe that they have some secret in clandestine uh, relationship with the Father that no one else knows about. And, and they believe that they do not need to go to church. They believe that they do not need to be a part of the body of Christ and that Jesus somehow is going to still bless them. And I'm here to tell you that that is not how the father works at all. The father, Jesus is very much in love with his bride. His bride is the church. Saying that we are kingdom is not spiritual code language, meaning that we don't have to like church anymore. That is not what that means. Jesus, come on, Brother, Brother Tom Moore is not planning on getting a bride anytime soon. And neither is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been for all eternity with his hand like he on his hand. Oh, come on, say hallelujah. And so he has no intention. Bride for church. Church is the vessel through which Jesus plans to bless And come on, raise your hand. Now this is the way plans to, to bless you. Is that all right? All right, let's talk about gathering for a second. Can we talk about it? Let's talk. Gathering comes from the Greek word episynagogy. Do you see the English word in there? It comes from the Greek word episynagogy. It simply means that the synagogue is at the center. All right? And so when we say that we're at an apostolic and, and prophetic gathering, um, what, what we're saying is that we are in a unique position to assemble together. To, we are being brought together for the purpose of completion to bring many parts together to fulfill a larger goal, a larger calling mandate that is unattainable by the individual parts. That should be why we gather here. The reason why we've gathered is because there's some revelation, there's some, there's some call of God, there's some grace upon the church. And we cannot keep our own people. Of the saints is, is, is a special vessel through which God desires to outpour his, his glory. And so we've decided to gather. Um, my my sister in law began to speak. Up. She said, "Why why is it that I'm always around around prophets? Why is it that I'm always around preachers? It's because you are attracted to the gathering." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whoever said it was not an accident. Now you can get Facebook, Instagram, apostolic and prophetic what? Yeah. Gathering. And you knew that was your tribe. You knew that was your tribe. You knew that was your tribe because you are prophetic. Thank you. I love, did she say she loved me earlier? I love my wife too. You knew that was your tribe because you are, say I'm prophetic. 
You are you are simply identifying with your with your tribe. Is that all right? Let's look at some scripture. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. Y'all just say amen a few times and I'll get there. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our what? Gathering together unto who? Unto him. Hebrews 10 and 25 has a similar language. It says, not forsaking the what? Assembling. That word assembling there is, is, is still the same Greek word synagogy or synagogy. It means not forsaking the gathering of ourselves what? Together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the as you see the day. Now, the, the first thing that I want you to begin to get as we talk about gathering is that there is an urgency on gathering here. Do you see that in the scriptures? The, 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 the sense about these scriptures, the connotation of these scriptures is that, yes, we should gather, but we should gather quickly. That's the connotation on these scriptures. There's, there's a sense of urgency that the more we see Jesus approaching, the more that we see his refreshing, the more that we see his visitation, and so there's a there there's there's a coming together of the body of christ which is more urgent today than it was on on yesterday that's how you got because you feel that there's an there's an urgency there's an emergency there's a rising there's an overflowing that's coming out of your your belly that is touched. Jeremiah said, it's my fire shut up in my bones. And so there's something on the inside of you, a calling that is awaking, that is telling you that it's time to gather. Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to gather. Can I talk about it a little bit more? Let's go to Romans chapter 13, verse 11. I want you to get this, the spirit of of urgency. Romans chapter 13, verse 11, it says, and that knowing the, the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far what? Spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of of darkness and let us put on the armor of of light and so this well the scripture is trying to quicken us the scripture is trying to propel propel us forward to catapult us forward so that there will be a sense of urgency for us to prioritize the things of the of the kingdom of god verse 13 let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness, drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the what? The flesh to fulfill the lust what? Now, when the Bible talks about the lust thereof in this sense, it includes sexual sin, but it is not limited to sexual sin. Wave your hand if you heard what I just said. For there are many things that we lust after being members of the body of Christ. We lust after money being members of the body of Christ. We lust after careers being members of the body of Christ. We lust after being married, being members of the, the body of Christ. We lust after just having things our way as members of, am I down your street? Yes. Yeah. Are you with me? And so sometimes there's a Burger King anointing on us in the body of Christ where we believe that it is necessary that it is in, that, that that we have the right to not move forward unless everything is our way. Look at your neighbor and say, that's lust, baby. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, flesh to fulfill the lust there what? Uh, let's read a couple more scriptures. Let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 14. I'm still looking for those two amens from the last two scriptures. Mark chapter 1. Mark 1 and 
and 14 says, now after that John, meaning John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of, of God. What did he say? He said, listen, the time, I want you to get, there's something about the time. The time is, is fulfilled. The other scripture said, the night is far spent. It is time to awaken. It is time to arise. The, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is what? Repent and believe the, the gospel. All right. What? Write this down. One of the first things that I want to impress upon your minds before we go any further in the gospel is that the first word of the kingdom is repent. When John the Baptist came preaching the gospel, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand or the kingdom of God is here now. That's what he was saying. But the first word of the kingdom before you can realize the manifestation of the kingdom in the now is that you must repent. The word repent is the Greek word metanoio, which, which, come, which has a similar prefix meta, like metamorphosis, which means that God wants you to stop going in the direction that you are going in and make a 180 degree turn to go in a different direction. That's what it means to repent or to metanoio. It means that, and, and, and it doesn't mean that direction that you were going in previously was in sin. Sometimes we get rebellious against the change of God because there's an assumption when somebody tells you to change that what they mean is that you were going in the wrong direction before. And not all the time does God call you to repent because you were going in the wrong direction. Sometimes God call you to repent because he just wants to do a new thing. There is something new in your life. There's a new calling, Sister Tamika, on your life that God wants to bring about that was different than the direction that you were going in before. Are you listening? Sometimes God wants to add something to your life just to bless you. God, Jesus, is just, the Father is just trying to bless you. Just like you want to bless your children. And so he calls for a metanoio, a change. Repent and believe the what? The gospel. Let's look at another scripture. I want you to get this and I'll almost be 25% of the way where I'm trying to get. Luke chapter 17. You laughing. Luke chapter 17. Let's look at it. Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. I still need those two. Amen. Luke 17, 20 and 21. It says, and when he had demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said, the kingdom of God comes not with what? Neither shall they say, look here or look there, for behold, the kingdom of God is what? All right. Can we get right to it? I just... I just want to get right to it. Mr. Kiara said, period, poo. Listen. <laughs> Let's look at this scripture. Can we look at this scripture again? One of the problems that we are suffering from, and when I say we, I just mean we in this room. One of the problems that we are suffering from being members of the body of Christ is that we are looking for something that we've already found. And so we are now becoming like the children of Israel who saw Mount Sinai over and over and over again as they were wandering in the wilderness. And so the, the problem that we are having why God called us to gather is to stop us from looking for something that's already within you. That is the specific problem for those of us that have come to this apostolic and prophetic gathering. Am I speaking directly enough this afternoon? Come on, I'm not talking about the conference that was in this hotel last week. I'm not talking about the church folks that are down the street. You know, your pastor used to say, I'm talking about the church. I'm not talking about them. I want to talk about the church that is in this room. Raise your hand if you hear me. 
One of our, say ours, ours. One of our problems in this room, those of us who are called to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers and miracle workers and deliverers and in interpreters and scribes and whatever else it is we've been called to do in this room is that we have become about the business of looking for something that is already within us. Jesus said the kingdom of God does not come with observation. The kingdom of God does not come by looking for. He said, in fact, you're going to see that people are going to start looking for church over here. And people are going to start looking for church over there. And he said, don't look for it when people tell you to begin looking for it because the kingdom of God is where? Okay, so I just, can I just get right to it? All right, let's look at, there, there's one problem that, that many of us say many. Many of us are having in this room, and it is that some of us need to start the church or ministry we've been looking for. I saw y'all. Did y'all guess? Y'all look back. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is within you. And so some of us keep going from church to church to church to church. Every time they give the invitation for you to become a member of the church, you didn't been to 10 churches you haven't joined yet. And you've been crying, Father, what you won't what you will tell me, Father, what church? Because he don't want you to go to nobody's church. How many churches are you going to go to? You're going to go from church to church to church to church, from conference to gathering to apostolic outpouring one after another over and over and over again asking God in prayer every night Lord show me what it is you called me to do and you're like the Lord is not he won't answer me he won't tell me that's because he don't want you to go to your church you are looking for something that does not exist because the thing that you are looking for is within you. There is a whole church on the inside of you. There's an entire choir on the inside of you. There's an entire deacon board on the inside of you. There's an entire board of Christian education on the inside of you. There's an entire auxiliary board on the inside of you. Keep looking for it. There's an entire pulpit on the inside of you. How many series does God need to give you in dreams before you realize there is an entire church on the inside of you? And so you are going to continue. Can I move? I can't move from this spot anymore. You're going to continue to march around finally over and over again looking for something that God is only birthing in you. That's real good, isn't it? You came all the way here for me to tell you that. Let's look at number two. I'm enjoying it. This is good. Oh, Elder Reggie is on this thing. He received that one. Let's look at another one. Some of us need to start the Bible study we are looking for. I just I just brought it down one level. When I said church, some of you almost croaked. And so I just brought it down one level. I'm just saying the same thing. By the time you get about 50 people in your Bible study, you're going to discover something. Guess what you're going to discover about the time you get 10 or 20 folks in your Bible study? You're going to discover what, you, what have you just started? A church. Some of us need to start the Bible study that you're looking for. There is 
an entire kingdom. Am I making this up? Am I talking in a different language? There is an entire kingdom on the inside of you, beloved. Are you listening? Jesus said, I didn't make this up. Your king, your Jesus, who you believe in, who you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believed in your heart that he raised him from the dead. Not me. I didn't say it. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is where? Within you. Touch your own, touch your own belly in Jesus' name. It is time. The night is far spent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus said that the kingdom was at hand almost 2,000 years ago, but you're still looking for it to get here. It is time to start the business. It is time to write the book. It is time to start the school. It is time to lead for Jesus. Jesus has been waiting your entire life for you to take hold of that for which he has taken hold of you. Let's read it again. I, I didn't say it powerfully enough. Now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we were. Believe the scripture said, by now you should be teaching the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Jesus is the light, light of the world. It's time to accept the call. That's what season we're in. That is what I am commissioning you to do today. It is time to accept the call. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called, say called. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles, the sent ones are, are these. The first Simon who is called Peter and Andrew, his brother James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus and Labius, whose name was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot who also betrayed them. These 12 Jesus sent, say sent. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles or into any city of the Samarians. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely do what? Give. The word sent comes from the Greek word apostle. Kenya said it comes from the Greek word apostolo. Say apostolo. To be sent means to be set apart as a special messenger. To be ordered to an appointed place. To be set apart for a special assignment. Say I will accept my assignment. To be sent or to be apostled means to be sent out with commissions. God is calling you. He is commissioning you to do something that no one else can achieve. You have a unique fingerprint. You have a unique calling. 
There is a unique anointing on your life. God is commissioning you to bring to the earth. Are you listening this afternoon? Now, what is the problem? Can we talk about the problem? There are there are three, maybe four, three and a possible problem that I want to talk to you about before we leave. Is that all right? Yes. Problem number one is the mark of the sent ones. Problem number one is the mark of the, the apostolic. Are you still with me? All right. What is, apostle, tell me problem number one. What is the, the mark of the apostolic? I want to help you. To be an apostle, to be apostolic, or to be a sent one, a messenger, presupposes that you are sent to propagate the message and agenda of another. What is difficult in the body of Christ about the apostolic, which is different from the pastoral teaching, which is different from the evangelistic, which is different from the even the, the, the prophetic, why the apostle is first, and, 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 and really why there are not that many apostolic schools. Have you noticed that? There are prophetic conferences everywhere. People are trying to get in to the prophetic. I, I don't know who told people that if you could prophesy, you could be a prophet. I'm not sure how that happened. It's because the words are have the same root. The words are the same. And so if, if, if you've noticed, there are not many apostolic schools. If, if, if you've noticed, there are not many apostolic 101 classes. There are not many places you can go to learn how to be an apostle. Have you noticed that? And the, 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 number, <laughs> the, the number one reason why there is not much clamoring to create an apostolic realm where the body of Christ can, can grow is because what the apostolic is about fundamentally is propagating someone else's message. What that means if you are going to be an apostle or if you are going to be apostolic, what it means to be a sent one, to be a messenger, is that you will not get the opportunity to say your own message. And what preaching has become fundamentally about is dispensing and spraying abroad your own message. And so consequently, there are not many preachers who are apostles because to be apostolic presupposes that you will not get the opportunity to tell other people what you think. Being apostolic by nature means that you are going to be someone whose primary function is to figure out what someone else's mission is and propel that. Even Jesus did not preach his own message. The message of Jesus was not an original message. Even the message that Jesus preached was the message of his cousin, John the Baptist. John the Baptist first came. You look at it in the first two verses of Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and you will see that John the Baptist came for first saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is what? At hand. It was not until Jesus was baptized by his cousin and Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted of the devil and succeeded that the Bible says. And from that time forward, Jesus also went forth preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is what? Not even Jesus got the opportunity to preach his own message. And, and, and so by nature, the number one problem with being apostolic is that you will have to take the time to figure out what someone else's mission is. Are you with me? Come on, let's look at the scriptures. Matthew 9, verse 9, Jesus passed forth. From thence he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. He said unto him, 
follow me. And he arose and, and followed him. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and do what? By very definition, apostolic equals self-denial. That is what the apostolic is about. The apostles of the New Testament, by very definition, were people who were agreeing to leave their families and die for Jesus. That is the mandate of the apostles. The mandate of someone who is saying they are an apostle of Jesus Christ, their assignment is to die for the mission. If you say you are apostolic, if you say you are an apostle, what you are saying is that you are agreeing to sign a contract to die for Jesus at the end of the mission. Jesus said, deny yourself. Take up your cross and do what? Follow me. Jesus said, in fact, if you really want to be perfect, go and sell all you have and give to the, to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in, in heaven. Come and do what? Y'all didn't like that scripture. Let's look at another one. Let's look at Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Let's follow another apostle. Y'all didn't like what Matthew said. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. It says, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, also, he said to them, whoever will come after me, let him do what? And take up his and follow. For whosoever will save his life will do what? But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels will do what? Will save it or find it. Or what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his for so by, by very definition, the apostolic is about making a decision to lose your life before you will find it. Before you can get to your calling. Come on, this is going to answer some of your questions. Before you can discover your calling in the prophetic, you must first make a decision to be of no reputation. Somebody said, why, why haven't the Lord told me my calling yet? And, and the answer might be because you have not yet made a decision to lose your calling. The answer might be that you have not yet made a decision to let your dream go. The, the answer might be that you have not yet made a decision to prioritize what you value most to give it over to, to Jesus and say, Lord, I don't care if I ever do such and such. Lord, I don't care if I ever step into such and such. All I want to do is give my life to you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you make your body holy, acceptable to God. This is your your reasonable service. Are you still with me this afternoon? Jesus said it this way. If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, another man's vision, another man's mission, another man's message, another man's calling, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your your own. Come on, just give me a wave offering if you're getting this word. I knew I was an, an apostle when I was 24 years old. I've served under so many pastors before we got the Kingdom Advancement Center. Lord bless me in Jesus' name. I used to make CDs for Gregory Dickow in Chicago in the basement of his church. How many years did we, we did that for two? I did that for two years. Had to wake up 
every Sunday morning at six o'clock in the morning so that I could get there before seven o'clock and record his messages. messages his messages then were on, on CD. When I was in the basement, then I knew I wasn't a possible. When I was making CDs for another man, then I knew that I could teach. I knew that I could prophesy with accuracy when I was in the basement, in an unseen, was told in the basement, in an unseen realm, making sure that the word of God from another man's mouth went forth. I was anointed remove burdens and destroy yokes then. But I first had to show myself faithful over another man's vision. Are you with me today? Problem number two. I told you it will be two or three problems. Are you still with me? How long have I been preaching? Problem number two. The second problem that we're facing in this room in the church, in this room, is that God calls two by two. Luke 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would, would come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is, is great, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his, his harvest. Problem number two, God calls two by two. To be a sent one also means that you will be mandated to share your calling with someone else. To be apostolic by definition means to be in submission to another, to deny your yourself. Let me say that again, it's going to hit you. The second problem we are facing is that God calls us into the apostolic two by two. And the problem with that is that what that means is that you well, if you're going to be apostolic, cannot be selfish with your calling. That's right. That's right. Because Jesus calls two by two. Okay, I'm gonna you let's 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 look at a few scriptures and I'm gonna I'm gonna help you. Amos 33. Can two walk together except they be what? Agree. Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if we have taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth when no gin is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet blow in the city and the people not be what? Afraid. Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord have not what? Done it. Look at this scripture. Surely the Lord will do what? No. Nothing. But his but he revealeth his secret unto his servants. What? How many of you are familiar with verse 7? But how many of you have thought about verse 7 in context? The context of verse 7, the environment, the context in which the Lord will reveal nothing to unless he does it to his servants or prophets is that two must walk together in agreement. Okay, let's look at another scripture that's going to come to you in just a second. Let's look at the preacher in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Verse 7, I still need those three amens. Ecclesiastes 4, 7, it says, Then I returned and saw that which was useless, that which was vanity under the sun. He said, this is what I saw. There is one alone, and there is not a what? A second. Yes, he have not child nor what? Brother. Yet is there no end of all his what? In other words, when there's only one person, there's no end to your labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither says he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also useless. This is also vanity. Yes, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one 
because they have a good reward for, for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he, for he have not another to do what? One more, let's look at it. Matthew 18, 18. The script the Bible says that everything be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Here's the third one. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I what? Because God calls two by two, he often calls married folks into ministry together. The problem here is that married folks are often the one group of people that cannot bring themselves to submit one to another, causing the kingdom of God to be in peril. Did I give you that one too quickly? The problem with the apostolic is that apostles are sent out. You just preached it just the other day when you were talking about the Antioch church. And the Bible said they began to pray and fast. And the Holy Ghost said, but separate for me, not just Paul, but Paul and Barnabas. How many of you were here when she preached that on Friday night? It's because God sends out two by two. Come here, uh, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, probably, girl. The problem with the apostolic, God's original, God's original apostolic team. Before we saw Aaron and Moses, two brothers, be apostolic. Before we saw Elijah and Elijah, two prophets, be apostolic. God's original apostolic design was male and female. It was to his original. Oh, this is a good word. Hallelujah. It was, it was to the original two that he gave the original mandate. What was it? Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and do what? Subdue it. It was not until after the fall that God started to depart from his original design. It was not until after the fall that God began to need a workaround to get us back to grace. Oh, come on, you got to begin to get this. And the problem, beloved, is that because God calls two by two, the kingdom of God is suffering violence because married folks cannot get their act together to agree about how to serve Jesus on one accord. Come on, let me go to another slide. Don't go that far. Because God, come on, Prophet Joy. Because God calls two by two, ministers with great anointings often cannot fulfill the call of God on their lives because their egos oh. and pride keep them from being properly yoked to others to properly advance the kingdom of God. That is a problem that we, say we, we are having in this room. The two by two call of God is called the anointing of the oxen. Let's look at the anointing of the oxen. Women of God, you can be seated, but don't move that far. We just talked about this. I believe it was Apostle Kenya who began to already preach and teach about Job. Was that you, Apostle C? I'm in the spirit. Job chapter 1, verse 3, speaking of Job, it says, His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500, say, yoke of oxen. And 500 yoke of what? Of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the, of the East. 
Let's go to chapter 42, verse 12. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his what? Beginning so that he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of what? Oxen and a thousand what? She asks, a yoke of oxen represents the power of God to plow the land, establish, say establish. It represents the anointing of God to plow the land and establish that God gives two, that only two servants of God who are together, you got to put your hand on my shoulder, who are yoked together can accomplish. That's what it means to be yoked to another. Paul and Silas, Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb. Are you with me? And so there, the, the anointing to prosper, the anointing to establish, the anointing to plow into territories that cannot be done by yourself is only reserved for the apostolic yoking called the anointing of the oxen. Somebody said, why do we not see many healings? The reason why you have not seen a healing is because you have not seen the yoke of the oxen. Somebody say, why do we not see many deliverances? Because deliverance ministry was always done. Read the Bible. Deliverance ministry was always done in the New Testament by a yoke of oxen. When Peter and John went to the temple called Beautiful and seen the man sitting there who was begging of arms, it was Peter who said, silver and gold have I what? None, but such as I had give I what? Unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and, and what? Well, but he did that while he was yoked the, to the apostle John. At no time do we read in Acts chapter 3 where the apostle John say, well, wait a minute, I have the anointing, let me do it. <laughs> At no time do we see in Acts chapter 3 where the apostle John say, well, wait a minute, I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. I want to be the one that lay hands on him and see him and see him rise up and, and walk. Because the Apostle John and the Apostle Peter were yoked together in submission, that's what caused them to operate in apostolic wealth, power. And so at, at this time, I want you to give uh, Brother Sam Palmore, Palmore a hand. Can you give him a hand? It was Brother Sam Palmore who, who opened the open heaven, he used his key to open the door for me to have this message. I didn't have no message before that. And so Brother Sam, come back, promise. Brother Sam said to me, my wife and I celebrated 21 years of marriage on the last day. So the Power Morris, um, along with um, our sister-in-law, and um, what's, what's the daughter's name? Samaya. Samaya. And Sister Samaya took us out and she blessed us in, in Jesus' name. They took us out to dinner on our 21 year anniversary. And so quite and so quite naturally, because we're so anointed, because we're so powerful. <laughs> Brother Sam, Brother Sam said, tell us what is the, the secret to being married for 21 years? Isn't that what he asked? And so I began to think about that. We began to, we've answered this question several times. And so the Lord said, just please tell him in Jesus' name. And so I said, okay, Lord, I'll tell him. And so what's the secret for being married 21 years? Well, the secret to being married for 21 years is that at least one person in the yoke of oxen must make a decision that it is okay to lose their life for the other person. No. 
Now, the, the Bible tells you, husband, that you be. <laughs> Someone must make a decision that it is not a world ending event if they lose their dream for the benefit of the other person. For Jesus said, he who seeks to save his life will, will lose it. But he who is willing to lose his life for my sake and the sake of, I like how you're holding my hand. He who seeks to lose his life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will do what? Find it. And so in the apostolic king, in the, the yoke of oxen, the secret to advancing the kingdom of God together, it would be nice if it were two people that made this decision. Say hallelujah, sister. It would be nice if there were two people that were willing to make this decision, but at least one person needs to be okay if they lose their identity in the other person. Or let me say it another way. At least one person must be okay if the other person controls the narrative of your life. Did you hear what I just said? The problem with being yoked together in ministry, whether it's a marriage ministry or whether it's a yoke together in ministry like this, the, the problem in the apostolic is that we must become okay that someone else controls our story. And we have to be willing to resist the desire to jump in and narrate the story when they tell the story in a way that does not show us in the best light. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. When you can do that, you can become apostolic. <laughs> First Kings 19 and 19. Thank you, prophet. So he departed thence, he meaning Elijah, the prophet, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. Did you see that apostolic number 12? Yeah. Elisha was moving in the apostolic. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, representing the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ representing apostolic government in the old and new covenant. While he was working, while he was plowing, waiting on another man's vision, the Bible said while he was moving in the apostolic, while he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the, the 12 one, that Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And if oh come on, you got this thing. And if you know the story, Elisha asked him for a double portion. Because Elijah understood that the apostolic mandate must come in to. Oh, come on, am I in Bible? If you want to move in the apostolic. It must come with a realization that you must give up the sphere of being comfortable mm -hmm. and step into the realm of apostolic uncomfortability. Oh, come on. Jill just got that. I told her I was coming. Come on. If you want to realize that for which Jesus gave his life for you, it means that you must deny yourself. 
There are several apostolic oxen teams in the Bible. Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb, Elijah and Elisha, Peter and John, Aquila and Priscilla, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas, Paul and, and Timothy. I can't get into that uh, right now. There are many different apostolic oxen teams. Two apostles can be an apostolic team. An apostle and a, a prophet can be an apostolic team. Doggone it, two deacons can be an apostolic team. Two intercessors can be an apostolic team. An apostle and an evangelist can be an apostolic Two saints, hallelujah. The kingdom shall be given unto the, the saints. Two siblings can be an apostolic team. Two business partners, two education partners, a husband and, and wife team are the original apostolic team. There are many combinations in which there can be apostolic teams, but it means, though, that we must deny ourselves. It means that we must be willing to get to problem number three. Where no oxen are, the crib is, is clean. Somebody said preacher's been cussing lately, so I can't say what I mean. Use your sanctified imagination. Where no oxen are, the, the crib is what? Clean. Y'all know, do y'all know why the crib is clean? Because what do oxen do? While, 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 they're, while they're pressing forward apostolically, to, to, and to press forward and then before plow in the kingdom of God, what do they do in the meantime? They mess on the ground. Where no oxen are, where, 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 where there's no one for thee and going, where no one has gone before. There's no mess. Where, where there is no one who's objecting to your service, there's no mess. Where there's no one who's not the same thing, where there's no what we're to do in the body of Christ in this room is that we have been trying vigorously to advance the kingdom of God That's why you That's why you that's why you haven't written that book yet. That's why you haven't written that book yet. Because you are trying to figure out how to live of God without problems. You're trying to figure out how to I do not want to marry the pastor. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean. Oh, come on, you got to get part two. But much increase is, see, haven't you been trying to increase? But the, the issue is that you keep trying to increase while trying to figure out how to navigate around the mess. And it has come back. Pardon. We make a mess every day, every hour. <laughs> Because we are oxen who are advancing the kingdom of God. Inside of that are arguments. Inside of that is, is conflict. 
that means that we're making a mess that needs to be cleaned up later. Uh, and, and we're not even talking about doing ministry outside of the two of us. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to church folks that are following us. Yeah. Trying to get your church to grow without a mess. Mm. Trying to get your church to grow, but trying to make sure don't nobody get pregnant outside of a wet mom. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Help us, Jesus. Trying to advance your without giving people grace. <sighs> Where no oxen are, the crib is clean. Mm. But there is much increase. Thank you, woman of God. Say much increase by the strength of the the ox. I'm almost done. Many of us are afraid. Lift your hands in this room. Ramba shike ndio boko ndia haya. Ndio boki ndia borondi ya haya. Ndio boko ndia. Rande dede be shiki ndia haya. Many of us are afraid to accept the true call of God on our life because we imagine that God will use it as an opportunity to turn our lives upside down. What we are trying to do by entertaining this imagination in our minds, what we are trying to do is control the mess. What you are doing by constantly thinking in this way is that you are trying to control the narrative. And what I have been sent here and as an apostle of Jesus Christ to tell you is that that plan will not work. He who loses his life for the sake of the king, Jesus Christ, and his gospel will find it. The way to discover what God has ultimately called you to do is to make a decision to be 100% willing to get everything that you possess. Jesus said, go, so all you have. Mm -hmm. To be willing to give everything you possess to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Only then can you truly find the calling of God for your life. Some of you have known all your life, which is why you haven't started that church yet. Mm -hmm. Because you know if you start that church that your life would no longer be your own. You know, if you start that ministry or that school or, or write that book, that it's going to take something from you that you're not willing to give. But the night is far spent. The light is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus said, repent and believe the, the gospel. Here's the last scripture. Here's the last slide. This is what I need you to accept. I want to commission you on this scripture. What you need to accept in order to get to the next season today about the yoke that you have been so afraid to put on your neck so that you can be yoked together two by two in your marriage, so that you can be yoked two by two in your ministry, so that you can be yoked two by two in the call of God on your life. What you need to know is that making the decision to forsake all for Jesus is light. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy, what? Lady. Remember in Ecclesiastes, the reason why he says it's heavy is because you keep trying to live by yourself. And Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Jesus, how are you going to give us rest? Look what he said. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. If you take on my yoke, then you shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is 
all of the things that I was trying to find in life by going to engineering school and getting my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, by going to business school and getting my master's in business administration, by trying to, to climb the, the corporate ladder so that I could receive a measly over $120,000 a year so that I could live in the suburbs and have a big house with a white picket fence in it in a Mercedes. All of the things that I was trying to get to in the flesh. I was there. And to get to in the flesh that I was in the rat race, never being able to get to. I found it when I made a decision to pastor with my wife. My salary went from $120,000 a year to $9,000 a year. And I made a decision to pastor the kingdom of man. You run it. You run it. You're, you run it. You run the math in your, in your mind. We have a house that is four times the size of the one we had when I was making 120 grand by myself. And we're still making less than that combined. But our house is four times as large as the one we had before. Because operating in the flesh in corporate America is not possible. It's not Jesus. And so what and protecting by operating in the flesh. What you don't realize is you don't have to do it by day. Every day, it's another day, less time to do what God has called you to do. It's another day that you will not obtain that which God has put in your heart to obtain. Because it can only be made to make the decision to lose it in order to. To find it. Stand where you are. The first invitation, those of you who are online as well, Jesus. Sister Kira, could you could you help us? Give Sister Kira a hand. The first decision that I that I want to ask you to consider is to accept the call of God on your life to deny yourself for the benefit of the gospel. I want you to think about what is it that you are holding on to which has stopped you from that deliverance ministry? What is it that you're holding on to that has stopped you from that healing ministry, that Bible study you're supposed to start? What is it that you're holding on to? And the first call that I want to make is a call for you to accept that, the call of God on your life. Not if it means, but meaning that you must deny yourself that thing for the sake of the gospel. That's the first call. You know you're willing to accept that call. I don't want anybody to move yet because I want you to think about it because this is not a religious calling. This is a calling that you need to accept if you know the answer is yes. If you don't, if you know the answer is maybe or I'm not sure, no, just think where you are. If you know you can answer yes, I want you to meet me up here. 